Celtic basketball has been a great life for me. It's been very, I've uh, been very fortunate to be on a team that cared about winning. Um, I think the people in Boston understand the Celtics. Uh, we're looked upon as, to me, we're looked upon as the leaders of, of this town because we have had success. Uh, but we don't stop there. We don't live on the past. We live for the future, and uh, we got to get back winning championships. Uh, you can't uh, cry around about one player. You got to go on. You got to try to find another player to replace him, and that will happen. Not. <laughs> I'll tell you, we saw the best. We were very lucky to have seen the best, all of us. And uh, now that's history. Socks open up. Bob's story very much because he told it like it was. Told the truth about Larry Bird. Good man, we'll miss him. Thank you, Bill. We'll be right back. Actually, can't get enough of this because it may be one of the few times we see him. You know, I'm going to take that and put it on a VHS tape and uh, save it for the future to look back on it because, uh, wow. Good idea. Yeah, definitely a day to remember, uh, even though it was kind of sad. Uh, definitely the end of an era in Boston today, even though we knew all along that Bird's retirement was coming soon. It was still a very emotional day for Larry, the Celtics, and fans all over New England. Um, this is not a sad day. It's a very emotional day, but it's not really a sad day because I knew this day was going to come sometime, and I sort of prepared myself. But once you s sign the, the papers and say you're retired, or once you get up here in front of these people, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. I've been on a high for 17 years. I've been playing basketball at a peak that... Uh, not very many people get to get able to do, be able to do. So I enjoyed it, enjoyed it. I just didn't like the injuries that I had, but that goes with the territory. I had one injury I couldn't shake. I've had a lot of injuries throughout the years, but the back situation, I just could not shake it. It feels better now, but it's not going to be 100% ever again. So as far as I'm concerned, I gave my heart, my body, my soul to the Celtics, and uh, hopefully we can continue to have a good relationship. Yeah, I would like to offer a toast to one of the greatest basketball players in the history of the game and one of the greatest Celtics ever. Captain. Hmm, yeah, still the toast to the town in Boston. Talk about accolades and memories. How's this for a list? During his 13 years, Bird was the 1980 Rookie of the Year, nine times All-NBA, three-time League MVP, 11-time All-Star, the 1982 All-Star Game, most valuable player, most important of all of us. How about the Celts? He led him to three world championships. Despite still being with the organization, Bird will definitely be missed on the basketball court. Now the question is, how will the Celtics react on the court when the Birdless era begins next season? Yes, even without the Bird, the Celts still will have a heck of a team. But you can't measure the impact he's had on individual players. He's the guy that helped me out more than anybody uh, could ever help me. You know, all, all the years I played basketball, that one year playing with Larry my rookie year probably put me over the hump where I could find out my talents, knew what skills I had, and how to apply them on the court. All right, meant a lot to D. Brown. Now let's talk baseball. To watch the Celtics play basketball, who knew that this long-haired, lanky kid from Indiana would come up with countless clutch hoops and a million remarkable moves. Gary Gillis has the Larry Bird story from beginning to end. He could never have imagined the role he would play in this city's history, not as a child, or even as a budding basketball star at Springs Valley High School in French Lick. Oh yes, Bobby Knight had heard of Bird, but it would not be Indiana. It would be Indiana State where Larry would make history, carrying his team to an NCAA showdown with Magic Johnson the start of a rivalry that would carry into the NBA and blossom into friendship. By now, Celtics fans cared very much about Larry Bird. He had been drafted the previous year as a junior eligible and would be the key in turning the franchise around. When I came here, they was winning 28 and 29 games, but uh, still they had uh, visions of winning championship. That's all they talk about around here. They don't talk about coming in second or having a good year because you came in third. You win. And that's all they cared about, and that's all I cared about, so we got along fine. The awards in 1980 would be individual, Rookie of the Year, All-NBA. Banner number 14 would have to wait until 81. Larry Bird was obviously a star, a player who made his teammates better. As a player, as a teammate, uh, he was the best to play with because uh, he helped me become a better player, and he helped me get that, that gold ring. And. Uh, that's what it was all about. Bird avenged his NCAA loss to Magic Johnson when the Celtics beat the Lakers in 1984. The Celtic-Laker rivalry would define basketball in the 80s, but this would be Bird's only championship win against the Lakers. Bird's final and the Celtics' last championship came in a battle against the Houston Rockets in 1986. 
And while Bird was measured by his championships, his game was defined by so much more. His absolute refusal to concede any game. and his love of meeting any challenge, like the one-upmanship show he put on against Dominique and the Hawks. But injuries would slow Bird down, beginning with double Achilles surgery in 1988, and back problems that would keep Bird out of action for much of the 90-91 season. Still, his performance against the Pacers in Game 5 in 91 was vintage Bird. When I played, I played as hard as I could. Um, I wasn't going to let an injury stop me from diving on the floor to try to do everything that I uh, was capable of doing to win a basketball game. But this back injury would require surgery. Just 14 months ago, Bird went under the knife and was optimistic about his future. If I felt good, um, I just had to try it again. I, I love to play basketball. So I came back. I got injured in December. And I thought it was from a spill that I took in practice. I got undercut one time. And from that point on, I really never recovered the way I wanted to. By May, when he played his last game on the parquet, there was only one thing standing between Bird and retirement, an Olympic gold medal. That came just two weeks ago. And since then, Bird has pondered whether he could leave this game he loved. I looked around and I smelled the roses. Uh, I was very proud. I, I haven't had an opportunity to play for my country. Uh, in a long time, and uh, I had an opportunity to do it. And it came at the end of my career, and yeah, you're right, I was very, very proud. But if you don't play for the Boston Celtics, you never play professional basketball. This is what basketball is all about. This is what uh, every player in the world, whether they like it or not, this is what you strive for to be. You want to be a part of a family, you want to be a part of the team, and the only way you can get that is play for the Celtics. Not for a year, not for two years, but for a whole career. And there's just very few players have been able to do that, and I'm very fortunate and very honored to be one of them. Good luck to you, Larry Bird, and thank you for all those memories. And by the way, Larry's retirement leaves us with just two active sports superstars in this town, Bruins' Ray Bork and the Red Sox' Roger Clemens. And as luck would have it... Absolutely enthralled listening to this guy whom I've never met, uh, don't know, seen him play only a couple of times, but there was a real dimension to the guy today. I mean, in an age of celebrity, overpaid, pampered athletes, this guy came across as a real human being with something to say. I, w I was thrilled listening to it. Mike, you know, in a career in Boston of a decade plus, there's been one incident, I think, in which there was some some brawl, but other than that, you don't hear anything nasty about his personal life. If yeah. there is anything, it's not in our face. And I think from what I've understood about him, that he's in fact a gentleman. He is a family man. He believes in the old values. And I know family not, values. Yeah, like... we'll talk about that later. But look, I'm thinking back in Barcelona just a couple weeks ago, he's standing there hand on heart, yeah. looking proud as the anthem plays. His teammates are covering Fools, up their logos the yeah. lest they offend their sponsor. Later, Magic Johnson twirls the American flag as if it were a hanky, and I'm being polite. And Bird, it seems to me, covered himself with the glory that will be forever the last image we have of him in play. He could be in pain for the rest of his life if he kept playing. Better he retires now. Yeah, well, apart from that, I mean, I could see, I could make a case for taking a video cassette of today's press conference and distributing it to several professional athletic teams around who should look at this in terms of this is how you ought to behave, and to eighth grade kids in terms of, you know, here is a guy who knows who he is. He used language very effectively, you know, he was a very shy and awkward at times today, but he knows who he is clearly, knows the limitations of, uh, of fame, stature, whatever. It was just, it was absolutely refreshing to see the whole thing. Mike, two endorsements of him. His agent, Bob Wolf, said to me at one point, when his book came out, he said, Larry Bird is the person of all people in the world he esteems most. I said, you mean of athletes? He said, no, of all human beings, most admires Larry Bird. Second one, Spike Lee hates his guts. To me, that's an endorsement. Good enough. Love the guy, and I hope he has a wonderful retirement. And you too, when you finally decide to hang it up. <laughs> a little dig there, did you catch that? <laughs> I think Bird's retirement is definite. Mike, a little old country bumpkin. But the bumpkin went on to help re-energize the NBA and become the personification of the Boston Celtics. He played the game better than anybody's ever played it, and he played it with a heart five times as bigger than anybody else I ever saw. But in the end, the sore back which had plagued Bird for two years just couldn't go anymore, 
so Bird had to. This is not a sad day. It's a very emotional day, but it's not really a sad day because I knew this day was going to come sometime, and I sort of prepared myself, but once you s sign the, the papers and say you're retired, or once you get up here in front of these people, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. The same could be said of Bird. His combination of pinpoint shooting, precision passing, and tenacious rebounding put him on 11 all-star teams, won him three most valuable player awards, and helped lead the Celtics to three NBA championships. Bird brought a whole new meaning to the wearing of the green. You want to be a part of a family, you want to be a part of the team, and the only way you can get that is play for the Celtics. Not for a year, not for two years, but for a whole career. But ironically, Bird's final moments on the basketball court were not in the green and white he wore so proudly, but rather the red, white, and blue of the United States and his recent gold medal performance at the Olympic Games. He didn't know then that his career was over, but now he does. Waking up in the morning knowing that I'm not going to be able to compete against somebody that night, it'll be tough. But it's something, it's an adjustment that will have to be made. For the fans, as well as Larry Bird. Mark Barger for NBC News. Okay, thank you, Mark. Now, checking... Break next. Hi, and how are you? Along with Mike Tirico, Chris Myers. Glad you could make it for the show. The show does not go on for Larry Bird. The Super Celtic has walked off the floor for the final time as a player. The chronic back problems force his retirement, although he will remain with the Celtics to work in their front office. Yeah, not a lot of uh, fanfare, speculation, or hubbub. It was just, boom, it happened on Tuesday, and Larry is retired. Tuesday, anyone who is someone in basketball was asked about Larry Bird. The words legend, great, best, they were used often. But maybe Pat Riley said it best. Pro basketball has just thrown away the mold. After 13 seasons, at age 35, Larry Bird retired Tuesday in Boston. And ironically, Larry did not score in the last game he played, a member of the gold medal Olympic dream team in Barcelona. Larry sensed the end was coming. You know, I would like to play it a little bit longer, maybe a year or two more, but uh, there's just no way possible I was going to be able to do that. So today I'm retiring, and uh, I'm still going to be around but uh, not in the capacity I once was. This is not a sad day. It's a very emotional day, but it's not really a sad day because I knew this day was going to come sometime, and I sort of prepared myself, but once you s sign the, the papers and say you're retired, or once you get up here in front of these people, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. We were able to stay together for a lot of years, and we had a lot of good memories. And I talked to him today and said, a lot of good wins, a lot of good times. He's one of the greatest players to ever play the game. I think him and Matty Johnson, them two, are solely responsible for the financial boom in the NBA. And I think all basketball players owe them a great deal. Uh, here's the guy that gave us perfect basketball. He uh, gave you great shooting. Uh, he gave you great passing. He was a great rebounder, but he couldn't jump. You're losing one of the greatest players to ever play basketball. Boy, was he fun to play with. Larry's numerical legacy, 11th on the all-time list in points, 3rd from one line, 4th from behind the stripe, and 6th in swipes. The more important numbers, the 6 most valuable players, 3 in the regular season, 2 in the playoffs, and an all-star MVP. The championships, a 3-ring affair, Olympic gold to close, Rookie of the Year to start. Only two other players won the regular season MVP award three consecutive times as Bird did, Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain. The Celtics never had a losing month during the regular season when Larry Bird was in their lineup. He was that kind of player, that kind of influence. Quiet, classy is how some describe the hick from French Lick, as Bill Patrick tells us. The legend began on the playgrounds of French Lick, Indiana. Bird wound up playing his college ball at Indiana State leading the Sycamores to the NCAA final in 1979, losing to Michigan State and Magic Johnson. That was the start of a personal rivalry that would help propel the sport to its highest level of popularity. Bird had been drafted by Boston in 1978 as a junior eligible. His impact on the Celtics was immediate and palpable and crystal clear even to him. It didn't take me very long to realize that uh, I was going to be uh, a great player in this league. Uh, it didn't take very long at all. How right he was. Bird averaged 21 points and 10 rebounds a game that season and was voted Rookie of the Year. He had turned the franchise around. His clutch play would become the stuff of which, well, legends are made. 28 seconds, Bird, trap pass to Archibald. Oh, 
Ahead to Henderson, the bird of the cut. But it was his unselfish all-around play which helped elevate his team that made Bird the player he was. Five times he led the Celtics to the NBA Finals. Three times they won, beating Houston in Bird's second season, 1981, besting the Lakers in 84, and the Rockets again in 86. But as memorable as Bird's performance as a player were the confrontations and rivalries he helped create. In the 80s, there was no better matchup in the Atlantic Division than the Celtics 76ers, Bird and Dr. J. But as intense and entertaining as those encounters were, it was when the Celtics met the Lakers that the world sat up and took notice. Three times they met in the finals, with Magic and the Lakers winning twice. And that was due in large part to the play of one of Magic's teammates. The best defensive player ever guarded me was Michael Cooper. I'll, I'll take that to my grave with me. When I got a chance to actually play against him, he was bigger than I thought he was uh, and uh, a lot more competitive than I had given him credit for at that time. But recently, Bird had been battling a different foe. Pain in his heels, in his back. Pain that led to these pictures, which led to his retirement. But the memories are more good than bad and simply too numerous to mention. But Bird did manage to come up with three. One was I hit a three-pointer in Houston to put the game away. Chris Ford remembers that one because he got it, been playing for so long, never won anything, so that was the first time he tasted the victory. <laughs> the second one was in game five in 84 when I hit a turnaround on Magic after we got defeated by 30-some points in game three. Uh, we, we won that game to tie up two and two where we could have been swept that day. And uh, in 86, when I was playing here against Houston Rockets in game six, I never quite had a feeling like that before in my life. He, of course, failed to mention the steal in Game 5 in 87 against the Pistons. Or this year's incredible overtime performance against the Trailblazers. Or teaming up with Magic to win Olympic gold. Like I said, memories too numerous to mention. It's been a great honor to be out here. There's only one place I'd rather be, French Lick. Thank you. He'll have a little more time to spend there now. When they started keeping these statistics for points, rebounds, and assists by the same player in the same game back in 1978, Bird moved right up behind Magic in that category. Larry once scored a triple-double before the first half ended against the Bullets in 1987. He had 69 overall if you include uh, his performances in the postseason. We'll have from the injured list. Great pitching matchup, we thought, in Boston. Clemens against Langston. Roger paying tribute to Larry Bird with number 30. But can you believe the umpires made him take it off the hat? They said it was a distraction. And this is really what's distracting, a slider and then two fastballs. And this one gets Gary Gaetti as Clemens leads the AL in strikeouts. Plenty of offense from Big Mo Vaughn out of Trinity Pauling High School in Seton Hall, his ninth home run of the year, a three-run shot. The Red Sox hammer Mark Langston and the Angels. Final 8-0, Clemens, his 34th career shutout, eight strikeouts, who has 164 on the season, and that leads the American League. Bird's scrapbook. The one thing that I know I did in my heart was I, when I played, I, I played as hard as I could. Um, I wasn't going to let an injury stop me from diving on the floor to try to do everything that I, I was capable of doing to win a basketball game. I knew what I had to do every night. I had to compete at a high level. I had to play as well as I possibly could play, and that's what I tried to do. And I hope they remember me for that. More of our tribute to Larry Bird. Instead of our words, Larry looks back in his own words. God may have uh, not granted him an all-world body, but from the shoulders to the top of his head, and from his wrist to his fingertips, he played the game better than anybody's ever played it. And he played with a heart five times as bigger than anybody else I ever saw. Welcome back. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, they are forever linked in basketball history. And Tuesday, Chris, Magic said Larry is the only player he ever feared. During his announcement in Boston, Bird reflected on many of his best moments and greatest battles. Now that we've looked back, here's Larry looking back in his own words. I'm not going to uh, really be too emotional today because I'd done that last night when I had time to think about it. But uh, it's... Uh, I didn't ever want this day to come, but it's here, so i got to deal with it now. I can remember my first day uh, very clear when I went to Marshfield and played against uh, Dave Cowns, Tony Archibald, 
uh, ML car. It seemed like everybody showed up that one day to see how good I was going to be. And uh, but the, the thing about it, I had Rick Roby guard me, so I thought I was, was going to be a little bit better than what I really was. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody else plays with all these other teams, and, and you know they make a lot of money, and they're, they always say they're very proud. But if you don't play for the Boston Celtics, you never played professional basketball. This is what basketball is all about. This is what uh, every player in the world, whether they like it or not, this is what you strive for to be. I get uh, emotional when I think about the fans, because I can remember sitting with DJ on the bench a lot of times, and, and the game would be over, and we'd be sitting there, and it'd be about 30 seconds to go in the game. I look at DJ, and I say, I cannot believe this many people would come out here and watch us play basketball. That was always mind-boggling to me. It still is. When they start chanting, when they start hollering, hollering, for some reason, inside my body, I don't know what would happen, but i go to the next level. I could take my game to the next level just off the roar of the crowd, and I'd done it numerous of times in the garden. I know from really 80, 81 to... Uh, 86, 87, that uh, there was a lot of nights where I felt I was the only one out there on the court. I could do basically anything I wanted to do. And then the injury started coming and it's been a lot harder. You know, I have a lot of dreams and, uh, about playing basketball, of course, because this is all I do, but I can never make a basket in my dream. We always win the games, but somebody else always makes the shots. Playoff time, it gets real bad. A lot of nights when we're in the playoffs, I uh, can't sleep at all. You know, you step all night and you get two or three hours sleep in the afternoon, then you play, then it's just a roller coaster ride all the way through. Well, I remember when I first came to the league and we played against uh, Artis Gilmore, he told me that I wouldn't last very long if I keep diving around. Well, it, it has caught up with me. And uh, um, the way that uh, I was taught basketball was that every loose ball might be that loose ball that's going to win a game for you. And um, I still believe that. Larry needs some champagne. Um, How about a beer? <laughs> yeah, that's his style, just yeah. a beer. That, that, I think it was Tommy Heinsohn who described the way Bird plays best when he said all the other nine players out there are playing checkers and Larry is playing chess. So the classic overachiever, uh, not great physical skills, has been pointed out. His hard work, his hustle made him a Hall of Famer. When he was drafted in 1978 as a junior eligible, he was taken sixth behind Michael Thompson, Phil Ford, Rick Roby, Michael Ray Richardson, and Purvis Short. Amazing, his uh, career. Magic Johnson called Bird the smartest player he ever saw. And uh, Larry's retirement has us thinking if Magic will stay retired. Their careers, they followed similar paths with different personalities. You know, Magic, the glitz, the flair, that fit L.A. And Larry's blue-collar ethic seemed to fit New England. Kind of an odd couple, but look at what they did together. Combined to put nearly a third more fans in the seats in the NBA. On average, seven times the dollars in the players' wallets, over ten times the TV rights fees. Now we wait to see if Magic will follow. First, another legendary moment. Back when I was in college, I always thought that I would want to be a race car driver or a tennis player because you sort of just uh, depend on yourself when you get out there. You don't have to worry about the other four guys come to play. But when you win a championship and you see uh, the smiles on 11 other guys' faces and the coaches and, and all the people around that's involved, uh, that's when you forget all about uh, the individual sports because if you win something as a team it means so much more. Harry, first a moment. Bird, who holds a number of records, including the Celtics team record for most points in a game. Bird went off on the Hawks in March of 1985, made 22 field goals in the game, had 37 points just at halftime, and finished with 60 points as Boston took on Atlanta. And did you know that Bird's highest scoring game was in a non-NBA arena? That's right, at the University of New Orleans Lakefront Arena. The Hawks were the home team for that great Larry Bird moment. All right, Mike and I continue with the breakfast edition of Sports Center. Highlights of all the late night baseball from last night. Stick around.